Hello, everybody, and good morning to all. I hope that you had a great uh, holidays, Christmas and New Year holidays, and you're going to have a very good week as well. So I will just repeat what uh, uh, Georgina said at the beginning, you know, three minutes ago, let's say, we had a delay. So she said that this, this session will be recorded, and then later the video will be published, will be shared in the, in the YouTube uh, channel of the PSD. So if you prepare to watch it offline, you can take a look at there also. Also, please keep your uh, microphone off uh, during the, the talk by, by our speaker. Uh, and I think that for questions or comments, uh, you can write in the chat or just for question or comments, you can turn on your microphone just to make sure that there is no noise and stuff. So, uh, so by repeating that, I would like to start uh, this session. We have a, a, a uh, a young as well as quite experienced researcher from Iran, Dr. Pejman Lutfi Kamran. He, Pejman is an, uh, uh, so it's my pleasure to give some very brief introduction of his background and what does he think. Pejman is, is an associated professor of the computer science and the head of the School of the Computer Science and the director of the Turin Cloud Services at the Institute for Research in Fundamental Sciences or IPM. Uh, so for those who doesn't know, IPM is one of the, uh, the most prestigious research institute in Iran. And, uh, 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 and as I mentioned, Pejman is leading the computer science department of that institution. His research interests include computer architecture with an emphasis on memory systems. And his recent work on the scale of server processor design lays the foundation of Kavium Thunder X, if I uh, uh, pronounce it right. So Pejman also, uh, he received his PhD in computer science from EPFL, as well as master and bachelor degrees in computer engineering from the University of the Tehran. He's also the members of IEEE and ACM. So uh, we are very happy today to hear from Pejman about his talk titled Divide and Conquer Frontend Bottleneck, which I think is based on their work in 2020 last year. So, uh, so I think by this, I would like to, uh, 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 to, to invite Pejman to start his talk. So please feel free, uh, Pejman, to start if you are ready. Thanks, Doc. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm very excited and happy to give this virtual talk at Barcelona Supercomputing Center. As Berta just mentioned, the title of this talk is Divide and Conquer Front-End Bottleneck. What is the front-end bottleneck? For there are several types of important workloads and applications for which the instruction footprint is very large. For example, in server workloads, the instruction footprint is in the range of multi-megabytes. And not only, the size, not only the size of the instruction footprint is large, but also the size of the instruction footprint increases approximately 25% every year. So we have a large instruction footprint for several types of very important workloads. On the other hand, the, the capacity of the components in a processor responsible to deal with these instructions uh, is very limited. For example, the size of the L1 instruction cache is about 512 blocks, uh, about 32 kilobytes of storage, and the size of the branch target buffer is about uh, 2,000 uh, branches. And due to this mismatch between the size of the instruction footprint and the capacity of the components in the processor responsible, uh, uh, responsible for those instructions, uh, we frequently encounter L1i and BTD misses. And due to those misses, the performance of a processor significantly gets hurt. Okay, that's the front end bottleneck. This is a very old problem. Uh, this has been around for many years, and not surprisingly, to address this problem, there are there have been many solutions. Most of these solutions uh, 
uh, have to do with prefetching. If we can, as I don't have enough capacity in my BTB, in my L1 uh, instruction cache, uh, I cannot uh, hold all the necessary instructions, but if I can prefetch correctly, I can have all of the necessary instructions ready that I want to use them. The simplest form of instruction prefetcher is an excellent prefetcher. Uh, we already have a next line prefecture in almost any processor or commercial processor today. A next line prefecture uh, has very low storage overhead, but at the same time, it doesn't provide us with significant performance benefits. But there are more advanced prefetchers that can give us more performance. Two of the state-of-the-art uh, instruction prefetchers include Confluence and Shotgun. Confluence uh, was proposed in 2015, uh, uh, and this prefetcher requires significant storage, but offers relatively good performance. The other state-of-the-art prefetcher is Shotgun, uh, which was proposed in 2018. Uh, Shotgun requires a lot less storage as compared to Confluence, and it offers almost the same performance. These are the state-of-the-art prefetchers. The goal of this talk is to introduce another prefetcher, which requires no storage overhead, and at the same time outperforms the state-of-the-art. That's the goal. And how do you want to achieve this goal? We observe that the reason that prior prefetchers could not achieve high performance with low storage overhead is because they were trying to solve the whole problem at the same time. They were trying, they were trying to address the front and bottleneck with a single solution. Instead, in this work, we try to divide the front and bottleneck into several smaller problems. We attack each sub-problem individually. We propose a solution to address the sub-problem. We combine the problems, to, uh, the solutions together to form a single solution to address the whole front and bottleneck. And we show that using this divide and conquer approach, we can improve the speed up of the state of the art as opposed to the state of the art prefectures by up to 16%. Here is the outline for the rest of the talk. First, I'm going to introduce you with uh, some of the important related work in the area of the instruction prefetching. Then I'm going to talk about uh, the idea behind our proposal. I introduce you with our proposal. I talk about the methodology of the evaluation. I show you some results and finally I conclude. Okay, the simplest form of instruction prefecture is a sequential prefecture. Uh, a sequential prefecture is very simple. Every time that we access a cache block, we also prefetch several of the subsequent cache blocks if they are not in the cache. So if I access block A, I check the cache for black A plus one, A plus two, let's say A plus three, and if they are not in the cache, I prefetch them. Uh, it is a very simple and low cost prefetcher, and it's very effective for continuous memory accesses. However, a sequential prefetcher, as the name suggests, is not efficient when we, ha when we have discontinuities, when we have branches when they have jumps. A sequential prefecture cannot prefetch those discontinuities. In 1999, the idea of fetch-directed prefecture has been proposed. The basic idea is that when we talk about, when we think about uh, instructions, we usually execute instructions sequentially. 
So we execute instruction sequentially unless there is a taken branch. If we have a taken branch, then the sequential execution will break. So the idea is that we already have components in a front end of a processor to predict future accesses, future instructions that need to be executed. We have a branch predictor, we have a branch target buffer, we have last in the front end of the processor. The idea is that let the front end of the processor go far ahead from the current, current instruction that we are executing and store those instructions in a buffer named fetch target buffer. So we let the front end of the processor go far ahead from the current execution point. We put those instructions into a buffer. Then it is very simple to check those future instructions one by one. And if they are not in the cache, we can simply prefetch them. Such a prefetcher works very well with very low storage overhead if the component, if the address generator can correctly predict future instruction, future, the address of future instructions that need to be executed. As long as we correctly predict those addresses, we can easily prefetch them and have them ready when we really want to execute those instructions. However, due to a variety of reasons, for example, a mistake in a branch predictor, a mistake in a branch target buffer, a mistake in a RAS, and so on and so forth, we may make a mistake, we may go to a wrong pass, and due to this mistake, we might not be able to go far ahead in order to correctly prefetch enough instructions uh, into the cache. In 2008, Fredman and others proposed a, an instruction prefetcher named TIFFS based on the idea of temporal prefetching. The idea is that uh, a program usually consists of loops, several loops. And due to those loops, we usually execute uh, a sequence of instructions several times. And due to that, it is highly likely that the instruction cache misses to be, rep to be repetitive, okay? And the idea of a temporal prefecture is to record and replay the instruction cache misses in order to benefit from the repetition in the misses. The structure of a temporal prefecture conceptually is very simple. It has two components, a history table and an index table. In the history table, we record the sequence of cache misses as observed by the cache. Every time we encounter a miss, we append the miss, the address of the miss, uh, to this history table, we also have an index table which points to the last occurrence of every address. So if I want to find the last occurrence of address A, we can go to the index table, find the pointer, and we can find it here. How we can use uh, history table and index table for prefetching? Let's say we encounter a miss on address A, uh, using the index table, we find the last occurrence of address A. From what we recorded here, we see that the last time that we saw a miss on address A, next we saw a miss on address D, then a miss on address F, X, Y, Z, and so on. So a temporal prefetcher can prefetch some of those misses that are recorded after A in the history table. Uh, TIFFS is very effective uh, and works very well. However, an observation was made that while we have repetition in the cache misses, the repetition in the cache accesses is higher. So this is essentially the basic idea of another temporal prefecture named PIF, which was proposed in 2011. 
essentially everything is similar to the previous temporal prefecture with one exception. Instead of recording cache misses, we record cache accesses. Okay, whole accesses will be recorded here. And not surprisingly, because of the higher repetition in the sequence of instruction accesses, PIF performs much better as compared to TIFFs. In fact, PIF is so strong that even now in, 2000, in 2021, it's considered one of the strongest prefer instruction prefectures available. However, PIF requires massive amount of storage. As we record the instruction accesses, the storage overhead is significant. The authors in 2011 worked very hard to come up with several types of compaction. They used spatial compaction, they used temporal compactions in order to reduce the storage overhead of this proposal. However, despite all the efforts, the storage overhead of PIF is significant, is in the order of 200 kilobytes of storage per core. You may compare that with the size of the L1i cache, which is usually just 32 kilobytes. So the storage overhead is significant, but it offers very good performance. Uh, in 2015, the idea of confluence was proposed. The idea is that uh, up until this time, uh, in order to eliminate instruction misses and BTV misses, we needed to have two separate prefectures. One instruction prefecture in order to eliminate instruction misses, and one BTV prefecture in order to eliminate BTV misses. Uh, Kainak and others observed that if we have an instruction prefecture, we may come up with some modifications in order to also prefetch for the BTB almost for free. The idea is that every time an instruction prefecture uh, prefetches an instruction block, when the block arrives to the cache, we decode the content, we decode the content of the block, we decode the instructions within the block, we identify the branches and we insert those branches into the branch target buffer, into the BTP. So essentially, if I have a, an instruction prefecture, I only need a pre-decoder, a simple pre-decoder that pre-decodes just the branches, just identifies the branches. It doesn't have to be a full decoder of the processor. It just needs to identify branches. And upon identification of a branch, we insert them into the branch target buffer. In confluence, they used a temporal prefecture for the instruction prefecture for the instruction prefecture component of the of the whole solution. While definitely this idea is effective, it eliminates the need for a separate BTB prefecture. However, as they use a temporal prefecture and temporal prefecture expose significant storage, uh, the whole solution is still not storage efficient. In 2017, Kumar and others proposed Boomerang. Boomerang is based on FTP prefecture. The main observation in this paper is that while there are several reasons why we may make a mistake when we want to identify future instruction addresses, as I mentioned, we may make a mistake in the branch predictor, in the BTB, in the RAS, and so on. The main reason why we make a mistake is because of the BTB misses. So, if we can, the idea is that if we can eliminate BTB misses, if we have a perfect BTB, an FTP prefecture is very effective with very low cost. So that is the intuition, and based on the based on this intuition, the authors decided to use the idea of confluence. 
However, instead of using a temporal prefetcher, they use an FTP prefetcher. What is the benefit here? The benefit is this. As with the idea of confluence, using the instruction prefetcher, we also prefetch for the BTB. So we reduce the number of BTB misses. And by reducing the BTB misses, we are going to have a stronger instruction prefetch. So the more we reduce the number of BTB misses, the stronger the FTP prefetcher becomes. So with this type of BTB prefetching, uh, they can improve the performance of the FTP prefetch. Definitely, this idea is very good, is very effective, works for very well for workloads with medium size instruction footprints. However, there is a loop here in this proposal. In order to have a strong instruction prefecture, we need to have as few BTB misses as possible. So we need to prefetch for the BTB and in order to prefetch for the BTB, we need to have a strong instruction prefetcher. So there is a loop here, and it turns out that this loop makes this proposal not as efficient for workloads with very large instruction footprints. In 2018, Kumar and others identified this mistake and proposed shotgun to somehow address this problem. Essentially what shotgun does is that in many sense, it's uh, very similar to the previous proposal to Boomerang to uh, Boomerang. However, it changes, it mainly changes the structure of BTB. They try to change the structure of BTB in order to be able to put more branches into the same storage budget. So what they want to do is to make, this, uh, make the BTB uh, with the same storage store more branches. How they do that, they divide the BTB into three parts. UBTB, CBTB, and RIP. UBTB stores unconditional branches. CBTB stores conditional branches, and RIP is for return instructions. Essentially, uh, in Shotgun, most of the storage of the BTB is dedicated to UBTB. The size of CBTB is very small. Instead, they aggressively prefetch into CBTB, and they decided to have a separate uh, structure for return instructions because with return instructions, the target of the return instruction doesn't come from the BTB itself, it comes from the RAS return address stack. And so we don't need to store the target of the return instruction in the BTB. So we can save space. Uh, this type of uh, BTB can hold more branches with the same storage capacity. And due to this reason, Shotgun can perform better as compared to Boomerang. However, this solution does not fundamentally solve the loop in the previous proposal. In order to have a strong BTB prefecture, we need to have a strong instruction prefecture, and exactly the same. In order to have a strong instruction prefecture, we need to have a strong BTB prefecture. That's a loop, and this solution doesn't fundamentally solve the, this problem. However, uh, it uh, reduces the BTB misses and, uh, in, and improves the performance of the prefecture as compared to the previous purpose. Up until now, I very briefly talked about various instruction and BTB prefectures which was proposed in 
uh, in the past. In this part, I want to motivate our approach, the divide and conquer approach. When we wanted to start this uh, research, this was our idea. If we look at the problem, the front and front problem, it doesn't seem to be a very difficult problem. After all, we have a sequence of instructions. We usually execute those instructions one by one sequentially. Sometimes we have a branch, we have a taken branch, and due to that branch, we have to actually deviate from the sequential execution. It doesn't seem to be a very difficult problem. It seems that we can address this problem with a sequential prefecture, with a sequential prefecture which was available since, I don't know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. We should be able to eliminate all of the sequential misses. With a discontinuity prefecture, which also was available uh, since 2005, and I will talk about uh, shortly, we should be able to eliminate the discontinuity misses. And if we have a good sequential and discontinuity prefecture, we can easily eliminate the BTV misses using the confluence approach. If we have an instruction prefecture, if we, if we have a, a strong instruction prefecture, we can eliminate all of the BTV misses. So the question that we asked ourselves was this, why a combination of a sequential discontinuity and the BTV prefecture doesn't work? Why previous researchers didn't use the combination of these three prefectures to solve the problem? What is the problem here? And then in the rest of the slides, I go over one of each component individually and try to convince you what is the problem with them, with each component, and we will fix those problems. Let's start with sequential misses. Essentially, most of the instruction misses that we observe are sequential misses. Somewhere between 65 to 80 percent of all cache misses are sequential misses. And a sequential prefecture, like a next line prefecture, in theory, should be able to eliminate all of those sequential misses. What is the problem? The problem with the next line prefecture is that it is not timely. Let's say I have the sequence of A, A plus one, and A plus two. When I see A, I prefetch A plus one. However, there is not enough time between access to A and access to A plus one, and therefore this prefetch is not very useful because it can't hide the latency of A plus one, the miss. So the problem with next line prefecture is timeliness. Okay, how can we improve the timeliness of a sequential prefecture? Very simple, by increasing the depth of prefetching. Instead of prefetching just the next address, we may prefetch several next addresses. A plus one, A plus two, A plus three, A plus four, and so on and so forth. However, that doesn't solve the whole problem. Take a look at this simple code. As you can see here, we have two function calls, and within one function call, we have uh, an if and an else statement. With the if and else statement, either we execute the if part or the else part. So let's say I have a strong next line prefecture. Upon access to black A, I prefetch A plus one, A plus two, A plus three, A plus four. What will happen if the if part executes and we don't execute the else part? A plus one will be a useful prefetch because we execute this if part. However, A plus two and A plus three will be useless because we do not execute the else part. And usually the code we have is 
fragmented. Either we have if or else, or if or sometimes we have function calls. Here we have a function f1. Here next to that we have function f2. When we return from function f1, we may prefetch several blocks that belong to function f2, and likely we will not execute function f2 at all. So the problem with increasing the depth of an instruction prefetcher is that it significantly increases the number of useless prefetches. How we can address this problem? We propose the idea of selective prefetch. The idea is that if we look at the two execution of the same uh, address, if the first time I touch address A, address A plus one and address A plus three are useful, but A plus two and A plus four are useless, the next time that I touch address A, the same thing holds. So we have the locality here. So we can learn this behavior for selective prefetching in order to prefetch only those blocks that are useful while we increasing the depth of sequential prefetching. Here, I quantitatively show you uh, the same thing that I talked about in the previous slide. On the x-axis, we have several several workloads. On the y-axis, I'm showing the percentage of accesses that, uh, for which uh, the footprint or the sequence of useful blocks after that are exactly the same. We can see that somewhere more than 80% 80, 80 to 95, 96% of uh, this, such predictions will be correct because of this behavior. Knowing this behavior, it's very simple to come up with a design to take advantage of that. We essentially need a table to record useful and useless sequential prefetches. We use essentially a very simple table, a direct map and tagless table. Uh, this table has uh, each entry of this uh, table ju is just a single bit. So we have 60K entry ta sequence table, which requires just uh, two kilobytes of storage. Take a look at this sequence, A, A plus one, A plus three, A plus five, and so on. Here we have A. With A, I go to this table. I see that A plus one is useful, and A plus two is not. So I prefetch A plus one, but I do not prefetch A plus two. Very simple table that can give us very good results. That was about sequential perfection. Now let's take a look at the uh, discontinuity visas. Take a look at this sequence. A, A plus one, A plus two, definitely sequential. Then we have B, which is a discontinuity, which might be a miss. B plus one, B plus three, sequential. Then we have C, another discontinuity. So what is the idea of a discontinuity prefetch? In 2005, uh, the idea of discontinuity prefetcher has been proposed. The idea is simple. Let's have a table and record these discontinuities. Record A plus two and B and uh, record B plus three and C. In the naive way, we need to store two addresses and each address is somewhere between 32 to 64 bits long. And so the storage overhead of this table is significant. So the author proposed to not to store the source, in this case, A plus two or B plus three, and just store the target, okay? So essentially we need a table in, a, in an original discontinuity prefecture where we record the targets. What are the problems with this proposal? We are identifying uh, two problems associated with the original discontinuity prefecture. One is that we don't have enough uh, timeliness. 
usually when we when I see a plus two or even when we see a, there is not enough time for us to be able to prefer uh, b and bring it to the cache. So the first problem is timeliness. The second problem is the storage. While in the original proposal, they only store a single address, but even a single address requires somewhere between 32 to 64 bits, and that's significant. So we try to address these two problems uh, to have a strong discontinuity prefetch. First, let's talk about how we address the storage problem. We observe that the discontinuity that we see here is due to the execution of a branch search. So instead of recording the target, which is long, let's only record the index of the branch instruction that caused this discontinuity in a cache block. So in a cache block, we may have 16 instructions, okay? So we may only need four bits in order to identify a single instruction. So with four bits within a cache block, we can actually record the branch responsible for the discontinuity. And by decoding the branch, we can determine the target. So we essentially change the structure of the discontinuity prefecture. Here is the table that we use. We record a partial tag, and we record the offset within the cache block that is responsible for the discontinuity. We have a 4K entry in this table, which requires only four kilobytes of storage. As every uh, row of the table only uh, is eight bit long. You may want to ask, why do we need to store only a single offset in the table, okay? There might be two or more than one branch responsible for discontinuities in a given cash flow. Here is the reason. We identified that most of the time, there is only one branch responsible within every cash flow. There is only one branch responsible for the discontinuity. Okay, 80% of the time, there is only a single branch within a cache block responsible for the discontinuity, and that's why we have only one offset here. However, if we want to store two or three offsets, every time we add four more bits, compare it as to the original proposal where we needed to store the full address, 32 bit minimum up to 64 bits we needed to store just for the address. Here, right now, in total, we need eight bits. If we want to store two branches, we need 12 bits, still significantly uh, lower as compared to the original proposal. What about the timeliness problem? We address the timeliness problem using a proactive prefetching mechanism. The idea is that Instead of triggering a prefecture, sequential prefecture or discontinuity prefecture, only on the demand accesses, let's also trigger them on the prefetch accesses. So in this case, if A is a demand address, that triggers the sequential prefecture, and sequential prefecture prefetches A plus one. A plus one may trigger the discontinuity prefecture, and discontinuity prefecture prefetches B. B, again, can trigger the sequential prefecture, and sequential prefecture identifies that B plus one is useless. However, B plus two is useful, so prefetches B plus two, and B plus two can again trigger the discontinuity prefecture, which prefetches C, the discontinuity prefecture can trigger itself and prefetches D, and this discontinuity prefecture can also prefetch the trigger the sequential prefecture, which prefetches D plus T, and do not prefetch D plus one and D plus two because it 
it identifies them as useless. This way, we can go far ahead from the current execution point and we can eliminate the timeliness problem of the sequential and discontinuity perfections. What about the BTV misses? Essentially, if we have a strong instruction prefecture, eliminating BTV misses is relatively simple. We use the idea of confluence, very, very similar idea to confluence, and using the, by decoding the prefetched instruction blocks, we identify missing branches and insert them into the BTV. While there are some minor differences between the way we do BTB prefetching and prior proposals, those differences are really minor and the main idea is very similar to the prior work. Okay, now let's talk about the, how we evaluated the proposal. We used Flexus simulation infrastructure. We used a variety of server applications, OLTP workloads, some of the cloud suite applications, and some web workloads. We, evaluate, we, we ran those uh, workloads on a 16-core processor. Each processor has a 32 kilobyte eight-way L1i and then and, uh, uh, L1d caches. Each processor has a two kilobyte, I'm sorry, two K entry BTB, a, a BTB that can hold 2,000 uh, branches. Uh, they use a TH predictor, a 32, kilobyte, 32 megabytes of last level cache, and a main memory. We compared our proposal against two of the state of the art prefectures. Confluence and Shotgun. Confluence is a temporal perfection. Shotgun is based on FTP. And if we compare these three prefectures across all the benchmarks, we see that Confluence and Shotgun perform very similarly, almost the same on average. Individually, on workloads with very large instruction footprints, Shotgun performs better. On the rest of the workloads, sometimes Shotgun perform uh, better. In this case, Confluence workloads better. better and, but on average, across all the uh, benchmarks, our proposal performed 5% uh, better as compared to both Confluence and Shotgun. Uh, and if we look at individual uh, benchmark, we see that almost in uh, all the benchmarks, our proposal is either the best or very close to the best. So it shows that it offers good performance, both for workloads with modestly sized instruction footprint and also for workloads with very large instruction footprint. Okay, uh, this proposal, uh, SN4L plus this plus BTB, consists of three different uh, proposals, a sequential prefecture, a discontinuity prefecture, and the BTB prefecture, which works synergically together to, uh, to eliminate instructions and BTB misses. Uh, our proposal performs the, uh, improves the performance uh, as compared to shotgun, 5% uh, on average and up to 16%. The structure, the tables that we use in our proposals are very simple. Essentially, both tables, the sequential table and discontinuity table, are direct map. One of them is tagless, the other one is partially tagged. Very simple tables. And we tried very hard not to change the structure of the BTB. So we don't, we haven't uh, touched the structure of the BTB. And at the same time, we prefetch for it. Uh, in this talk, I didn't uh, talk about uh, some of the, some of all the studies in detail. 
I didn't uh, talk about shotgun in detail and why shotgun uh, does not perform as we expected to perform. Uh, I didn't talk about the variable links ISA. Uh, it just suffice to mention that uh, the original confluence uh, style of BTB prefetching, the original confluence only works for fixed links ISA. Uh, in our proposal, we proposed a solution in order to enable a confluence like BTB prefetching for uh, also for variable links ISA. I didn't uh, mention how precisely we create this proactive chain and uh, we ran many different uh, evaluation studies. We studied the scalability, complexity, search overhead, storage cost, and I didn't show you the results. However, I will be more than happy to talk about any of these things uh, in the Q&A. Before I want to finish this talk, I want to give credit to the, my co-authors uh, who did most of the work. Uh, the first one is Ali Ansari, my former student who is currently a PhD student at AVFL. He essentially did most of the work for uh, this uh, research. And I also need to mention Hamid Sarbazi Azad, the professor of CSCE at Sharif University of uh, Technology and IPM, who contributed significantly uh, to this work. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm glad to take any questions. Thank you so much, Ejman, for your uh, interesting and great talk. And was quite uh, uh, nice. So I think that we have a couple of minutes to take some questions, at least 10 minutes, even more if, if necessary, I think. So please feel free to ask your question in the chat or, uh, uh, or you can just turn on your microphone and speak out as you prefer. So meanwhile, we are waiting. I can maybe ask a first question. Uh, so, uh, question. No, go ahead, sorry, sorry Adam. go ahead, please. I have a question because what I saw that you are need a sequence, but the sequence depends on the branch predictor at the end, because you can have a branch, so you change your sequence and you go to another address, or you can continue doing a sequential one. So, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand the question. You, can you repeat that again? Okay. You have a sequence. The sequence has sequential access until this ends because you have a branch and you go to another direction. But this depends mm -hmm. on the branch predictor. So all this prefetch at the end will be depend on the branch predictor. Uh, the prior proposal, the FTP style, yes, they depend on the branch predictor. But our proposal is independent of the branch predictor because we have our tables, we have the sequential table, and we have the discontinuity table. We don't rely on the branch predictor to tell us where to go. And that's why we can perform well on workloads with very large instruction footprints where there are lots of potentially BTB misses. When we have a BTB miss, we even don't know that there is a branch. And so we don't even don't consult the branch predictor to identify the direction of the branch. No, no, no. And that's no. why those proposals don't perform well on workloads with very large instruction footprints. No, my question is more how you create the sequence, because the sequence can end always. The sequence ends or in a champ, assuming that forget about the champs for a moment, because I see that simpler. But if you have a conditional branch at the end of the sequence, how you decide that you need to go to the next one or so taking the branch or not taken? Because uh, in one case, what we do, uh, I'm sorry, what we do is that as instructions execute by the processor, the real instructions that being executed by the processor every, at the commit stage, we record them in our tables. So we exactly know 
the sequential instructions that were executed in the past, we have them, we record them in the tables, and we use them to actually prefetch future leases. In prior proposals, they don't care. Essentially, the sequence never ends, okay? You have a, uh, if you look at if, uh, Shotgun or Boomerang uh, or FTP, essentially the sequence doesn't end. You, the address generator generates a sequence, okay? It generates the sequence until, and the, it continues to do so, until the back end tells the front end that it makes a mistake, it predicted that the branch to be taken, but in reality it was not taken and so on. Then the address generator would come back to the last correct part and continue to generate addresses. Okay, the sequence never ends. It only stops when we receive a feedback from the back end to tell us that, okay, we made a mistake somewhere, but we predicted was not correct. So let's come back and start again. Okay, thank you. Thank you. More questions? Is there any? I, I was going to ask that uh, uh, I, I don't know if there is any uh, neural network related branch predicted or not, uh, because at the end, the, the idea that the goal is to somehow predict the branches, and neural networks have been shown that they are good in prediction this other application. So my question is that, first of all, is there any kind of that, that kind of approach? If so, uh, so what, so did you compare that you result with them? Or if not, there doesn't exist, what do you think? Would it possible, feasible to go in that direction or not? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, yes, there are uh, branch predictors based on neural networks. However, when we think about when we think about FTP style of instruction prefecture, the main problem is not the mistake in the branch predictor. The main problem has to do with not no, not having a branch in the branch target buffer. That's the main bottleneck. Okay, and you might be surprised, but if we change uh, the strongest uh, branch predictor, an ideal branch predictor, with a very simple one, we don't lose much in terms of instruction prefetching if we have an ideal BTB. So the main problem has to do with the BTB, and uh, so the instruction prefetcher is not very important here. It has some, oh, I'm sorry, uh, the branch uh, predictor is not very important here. It has some role, but it's not the main component influencing the performance of the uh, FTP prefecture. The other thing is that while there are branch predictors that work uh, based on neural networks and they work very well, uh, TAGE that we used is essentially one of the best. It can compare again, it can compete to, against uh, uh, branch predictors based on neural networks. And we use the very strong uh, branch predictor in order to boost the performance of our competitors because they benefit from a strong branch predictor while we don't. We don't, uh, we don't use even a branch predictor uh, in our proposal. Thank you. Okay, I think we have three minutes more, but just I would like to announce that this talk will be uh, is going actually is recorded and will be available offline also or later. You can also contact Perman for the email if necessary. But if there is one more question, probably we can take it. Yeah, I think there is not more question. So, uh, uh, so I would like to thanks again, Fejman, for his great talk and for his time to speaking here for preparing the presentation of everything. So that was great to have him and 
uh, I hope that it was a great discussion online and also we will have, uh, as I mentioned, the possibility to continue discussions offline through the emails uh, and hopefully later we will be able to uh, host you in, in person here to have a real meeting instead of virtual meetings basically. So, uh, um, so thank you again. Thank you all the uh, attendees also. Also thank you the, the organization team, Georgina and others. Uh, so. Besides, I can uh, say for one question more because I. Sure, sure, if you are going to. Sorry for that. Mm -hmm. I want to know maybe you have the answer. How much we lost for this, uh, we can say, uh, how much we lost waiting? So, in terms of percentage of the total execution time. So, we know how that we. We know the way we, with these prefetches, we can win 16% uh, of, uh, of the total time, according to you, you have. So you have, a, you have a speed up of 16%, okay? My question yeah. is, what is the maximum, assuming that we don't have any of these problems, how much it would be the speed up? So how much we can win on in which state we are? We are near the beginning or we are near the end of the what we can achieve? Uh, definitely we are not at the end. Uh, I don't have the exact uh, number. Uh, I have to look uh, the paper. Uh, probably it's there. But if I want to guess, I believe that we can get maybe 10 to 15 percent more performance uh, as compared to what we proposed here. Uh, however, yes, it is not, we are not still at the end. Uh, there are still room for improvement. I can say even th th there is significant uh, potentially room for improvement as compared to this proposal. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, now we are at the end. I want to take this opportunity to thank Behzad and uh, everyone else. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I'm very happy that I gave this talk at Barcelona Supercomputing Center and I hope that I can see you soon in person somewhere in the conference at, in Barcelona, air places. Great, yeah, hopefully, yeah. So Georgina, do you want to say something? I think you... No, for me, no. Thank you very much for this nice talk also. Yeah, okay, perfect. Okay, thank you so thank much. You. Have a good day, good evening, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. And goodbye. Bye.